hope you all are noticing just how um, clueless I am up here. Not quite sure what sections of the service I'm doing and other people are doing. You would think that after all this time, I would be a professional. See, my pens are falling. Someone asked me, oh, did you intend to have this music stand here? I don't know why the music stand's there, but now it won't appear in the live stream. Fix that. Look at this. So I, I, I'm a little anxious. I'm anxious every Sunday before I, before I preach, whether it's at my own church or a fancy church like West End Collegiate. And, um, and this, this, this morning, I reminded myself of how much fun it was as a child to go to church on a holiday weekend when the pastor was away. Because first off, when the cat's away, the mice have a good time. And secondly, like you'd always get a new, a new pastor. The new pastor wouldn't necessarily know what they were doing. And everybody just like took a breath and was like, oh, this is great. We don't have to like get it all perfect. We can just have a good time. And so if you're looking for perfect church, um, it's not going to be here. I'm sorry to disappoint. But if you're looking for a good time, you picked a great weekend to show up at church. And in fact, that's really what today's scriptures are about, I think. They're about a sense of calling amid mystery. So before we get into that, I want to immediately say thank you to all of you for being such wonderful friends. And if you're not really sure why I would start out by saying that we were such wonderful, you were such a wonderful friend to me, uh, well, most recently you hosted my father's memorial service. And it was no small feat. It involved many, many, many moving parts, not the least of which was a grieving family. I, um, I was overjoyed when Will asked me if I would preach for him because I could just start to go and repay my gratitude for what he endured with my family that weekend. But even more so, you did something really special for my father years ago here. You provided him a new chance to live out his calling. And I'm confident that all of you are like, what are you talking about, Ian? Well, in 2005, my father was fired as the president of New Brunswick Seminary, and then he was put on trial, and then he was defrocked from the office of being a professor of theology for uh, officiating, officiating at my wedding to my wife. That's relatively well known. Um, but what's less known is that my dad, more than anything, loved being a teacher for the church. And as they were determining what his discipline was going to be for having officiated at my wedding, many suggested that he was not to teach ever again anywhere in the Reformed Church, which to me, it felt like a sin, mostly because I'm cheap and I'm kind of a good steward, okay? And the church had put a lot of an investment in educating that guy in order to go and teach about the Bible. He was incredibly gifted. He knew Aramaic. So that he could actually go and work on, I think it was one of the fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was so esoteric, I even now don't even know what he did. You had to be that smart to do it. And for, for me to think that the church would go and lose such an amazing resource with such a gifted calling, it just felt like bad stewardship. And you all were so kind and gracious as to invite him to come and teach, I think it was probably a four, you were there, Mike, was it like four weeks, eight weeks, Bible study. The beautiful thing of this is, you thought you were getting a really great deal, right? You had the, the former seminary president coming to go and teach the Bible, which he had a PhD, you know, and you thought that you were getting a great deal. And instead, what you were doing was letting a guy live out his calling. It had such a profound impact on him that every time I have come and preached here, 
he would want to know how some of you were doing that he remembered from that Bible study 20 years ago. He kept up with your emails and your website, and he felt so connected to you all. And that's why it was such a gift that you were willing to go and host his memorial service last month. It felt like a coming home. And you didn't even know that you had done that. Over the years, you have supported the ministry of the Greenpoint Reformed Church, not just financially, but with your prayers and your, just your kindness. Just knowing that West End is here helps our church in Greenpoint to feel connected in ways we often don't feel connected to other churches. Our shared worship services over the COVID time were such gifts to us. Again, I bet it might not have felt like that for you all. But what this church does is it supports people in living out their sense of calling in big ways and in small ways. And I think that that's why you're here today, because you have a deep sense of calling in life. And you come to church in order to fill up that tank. That Sundays are the retooling of the engine that allows you to live out your calling the rest of the week. So today's scripture, from Isaiah, we have the calling of Isaiah. Isaiah sees the Lord in a rather trippy vision with seraphs coming down and touching lips with coals in order to go and take away Isaiah's sins. And then we have Nicodemus who's asking questions. And Jesus is being kind of weird in answering them. Okay, let's be clear. Nicodemus is just doing what we all do, and Jesus is being very surly in my opinion here. Jesus could just explain it a little better. It's a reoccurring theme, Jesus. Could you just get a little bit more clear? But this sense of being born again, of starting anew, and of seeing the divine can really inspire us no matter where we are or who we are. I love it that in Isaiah, Isaiah responds, here I am. I am not called to be a biblical scholar. I skated through the biblical Hebrew class in seminary, not by the skin of my teeth, but by a computer program that translated it, like early AI for biblical scholars. The one phrase in Hebrew that I can remember is that Isaiah responds, Hanani, here I am present. Here I am, Lord. What I know that I am called to, if it isn't learning Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and being a deep biblical scholar, that's all the biblical scholarship you're going to get in this sermon, by the way. Sorry. I mean, you get what you get and you don't get upset on Sunday mornings. But what I actually am called to is inspiring us in our own sense of calling, to see and to respond to who God is calling us to be. And here's the kicker. It isn't as grand as we might think. Isaiah responds, here I am. That's it. Here I am. We just need to be present. To be here, to be fully human and fully alive, to be fully not divine. Matt's children's message about the Trinity was a great reminder that we do not have to be the Trinity. We do not have to be God the Creator, God 
the redeemer or God the sustainer. We just have to be our best human selves, warts and all. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to show up. Being fully alive means taking risks in showing up, in not hiding who you are or who God created you to be. Isaiah goes on to do many amazing things as a prophet, but they began with his mere statement, present and accounted for. I've really enjoyed puzzling in my own life about this nature of call. Because I was raised as a Dutch Calvinist, where work was emphasized. Constantly working, being useful, a good steward, getting things done and accomplished, they're good and probably needed. But they aren't our highest calling. Our highest calling is to be. To just be. And to share our humanness with those around us. For me, that has been the challenge of a lifetime. I like to go and tell you about all the work I do because that's how I defend my very being. Perhaps you can identify this. But then what happens as we age? What happens when we're young? You can't tell me that those children here aren't called to be. And you certainly can't tell me that those who are older don't have a sense of calling or those who are unable to work. One of my Life's joys is to be able to serve as a chaplain in the fire department. And um, perhaps you're, you're familiar with the concept of a, of a work wife or a work husband. So I get to have a, I'm the work wife to the Franciscan priest. There has been no greater joy than calling up his superior and introducing myself as, Hi, I'm Father Chris's work wife. Father Chris is an 83-year-old, I believe 82, 83-year-old Franciscan priest, and over the years I have watched as he's moved from being the chaplain at the College of Mount St. Vincent, where probably up to about seven years ago he would still go on the freshman year mission trip. One year I said, are you really sleeping on the floor with those students? And he said, I did up until last year and now I've requested a cot. And I thought, wow, um, I'm not going to be able to do that much longer. I'm not sure I will ever be able to go on a church youth group with a whole bunch of teens. And yet, here he is doing this well into his 70s. And I've watched him as he prepared to retire from being a fire department chaplain. And he said, you know, I have gone out to 3 a.m. fires my whole career. I'm not sure I can do it much longer. And I said, well, that's why you have me, your little probie. Send me out at 3 a.m. And I said, I need you. I can't do this without you because one day I'm going to be the one who has to give last rites. And I'm terrified of that. Don't worry, Ann. I'll teach you. I'll walk you through it. You'll be fine. And as he continued to get older, I went out to more 3 a.m. fires and did more of the physical side of the job. And he became more of the person who guided me through it. It was a deep sense of calling. He retired two years ago. And not long after his retirement, I was called upon to go and respond to a firefighter who had died in his sleep in the firehouse. I was so terrified about this, I completely forgot to pack the holy oil. Because again, you know, they don't really cover Catholic last rites in Protestant seminary. And in that moment, 
I figured out and I made do. And a couple of hours later, I realized I hadn't even called Chris. And he said, see, I knew you could do it. And whenever you're afraid, just give me a call. Just a couple of months ago, we got a call for a young man who had passed away. His mother was the fire department member, and she was Catholic and really wanted to have a Catholic priest. And so they called for one from the hospital. He did not manifest. I was getting more and more anxious. I explained that Protestants can do this in lieu of a priest in certain circumstances and that I would do my absolute best. And then I remembered, I've got Chris on the other end of the line and we FaceTimed in. To me, it felt like he was able to live out his sense of calling in spite of a hip that needed to be replaced, in spite of difficulties walking, that his very being was what allowed him to continue to be called. Perhaps the notion of call is using our whole selves in whatever shape we come to respond to the gift of God's love and God's grace, that God loved the whole, whole world, all of the world, so much that God gave his only son. Whoever believes will have eternal life. Whoever believes will live a life so alive in a sense of call that we're able to go and share God's love. And I think that that is what's really exciting. It's an exciting opportunity for us to join with God in God's mission. And that it can look like the incredible diversity that is our understanding of God that it's absolutely a manageable proposition for each one of us here today to say, I am here. That's it. Yes, God, I am here. I'm here and I'm open to receiving your message. I'm here with my whole sense of self and I offer it up to you in whatever condition it is. One of the most terrifying messages I have ever received. It's in a poster at the FDNY Academy, and it says, a message not acknowledged is a message not received. If you were to email me, you would receive an automatic out-of-office reply that says, I'm terrible at responding to messages. Please send me a text or call if you need me. Acknowledging messages to me, it just feels like an unknown, terrifying prospect. And so I can understand somehow it might be a bit of a terrifying prospect for us to respond to God and say, here I am. But if we all do it together, the prospect is a little less terrifying. I will never be a Bible scholar. It's not my calling. Mine is to go and be fully alive. God knows deeply what causes you to be fully alive. Perhaps it's a gift of hospitality. I have never seen my friend, Will Kritzman, delight as much as when he's talking about cooking a good meal. Fully alive. Perhaps yours is being fully alive when you greet one of your neighbors. Perhaps you're fully alive when you are alone with a good book. Maybe some might say you're reading. Others might think it was praying. You know what makes your heart sing. Saying, here I am, is allowing your heart to sing. Whether it's hospitality or prayer, or even doing paperwork. Do it for the glory of God. 
When you say, here I am, you're just saying, I am alive, God. Use me as you see fit. And the rest is up to God. And what a great opportunity it is for each of us to live out God's love. When we say, here I am. Here I am, fully alive. Use me as you will, God. I hope that you will feel fully alive at some point this week. And when you catch yourself, do more of that. Offer that up for God. Here I am. Amen.